Hello everybody. Um, all those that are already in, very welcome and uh, we'll be starting in a few minutes. In the meantime, a little music to wait for the others to catch in. Lovely tune called Dubuque. Back to five. <laughs> Check in. 
Um, happy to be here with you all. And uh, right now I'm uh, working on a harmonica for a friend that's got a, a kind of a special tuning in it. It gives me an opportunity to uh, show a few of the techniques that I use when I'm working on harmonicas. So let me just uh, tune in to on this computer here so I can see if anybody has any questions. Give me a second here. Let me get these set up here. And where am I? Uh, okay, I have to find myself. How do I find myself? Okay, I think I got it. Got it. Okay. Hello, everybody. Matthias Ernst, John Phillips, Christian Vergli, David Corant. Welcome, everybody. Okay. What I'm doing uh, is uh, uh, it's a it's an old Honer 12-hole soloist harmonica in the key of C that I'm converting to a uh, special tuning that a friend of mine uses, and it's a. Uh, hold on. Let me turn off the. Okay, turn off the amplifier down there. I think we're good to go. Um, right, um, yeah, it's an old 12-hole Honer soloist, and uh, going from the key of C down to a custom tuning around in the low A range. So it's pretty drastic kind of a change of the tuning. No, it's gonna, gonna be dropped down as much as almost an octave and a third. So <clears throat> when I'm doing a, a, a custom tuning, uh, say, for instance, if I'm if I want to shift all the notes up one position, so I get gain an extra note on the low end, lose one on the top end that I might be using. The way I the way I set about it is I make a little chart, kind of like this, and you can all see that. And uh, what I start off with is on the on the inside rows. It's um, I have. The two, the, the the prospective key that I want, the object or the goal, and top row there is blow, draw, holes one through ten, and then outside of those, I put in the key harmonica that I'm starting with, and uh, and then I can compute how much of a, a variance in the original tuning it's going to require, and I put that up here, um, and in what I can do in this case. I can I, if I can plug different key harmonicas in to see which keys are easiest to work with, which keys may not require any changing of reads or any drastic retuning. Um, so it's a handy way of doing it, and then I save them. And I can I can I can use them for other tunings that I'm working on, vari variations on them. So this is the one that I'm working on, and you can see that uh, the, I'm going to be dropping some of the reads all the way 15 semitones down so uh, that will be fun so the first thing that I do when I'm starting to work on reeds is I'll make sure the reed is centered in its slot and for that I use a uh, a reed wrench you can see that there there it is and uh, you can see how the, the jaws, this, this one that I made myself, the jaws on this wrench are very, very narrow. That allows me to get in between the reeds. And so when I'm, when I'm moving a reed one way or the other, then it doesn't hang up on the other reeds and rivets. So I'll, I'll take the, uh, the reed and set it up like that in the, on the reed rivet pad and uh, hold it up to a light. Now, back when I was just uh, finishing up university and, and looking at what I wanted to do with myself, I, I called into an old Italian accordion technician down south of Los Angeles to see about the possibility of him taking me on as an apprentice, which he wasn't keen on taking apprentices, but he did tell me that when you're centering a reed, the best light to hold the read up to is northern sky because in the northern sky you have the sun going behind you and you don't have any glares 
so you get a nice even light. Now, that might work for, well for Southern California and Italy, but uh, here in Ireland we might not get so much even light. But that's, uh, that's what he said. Uh, I've also seen in some of the harmonica factories I've been to, uh, in, in the room where they're actually centering the reeds and riveting them, the room will be fairly dark and each of the workers will have a low watt light bulb in front of them with a sheet of white paper in front of it and that gives a nice even light and they'll, they'll hold the reed up and center it nicely. This is particularly important when you are embossing a reed because you're going to be narrowing the reed slot and if the reed is a little bit off one way or the other then they can kind of touch so center the reed first um, and uh, the uh, uh, the next step that I'll do is to chamfer the reeds. Now this is a this is a technique that I heard about from Sissy Nietzsche, who who was the uh, head of the harmonica service department at Honer when I was there as head of the accordion service department, and she told me that she had heard some of the old timers used to do this to their reeds, so I gave it a try and I thought it worked pretty good. So um, and it's kind of does the same thing, one of the same things that uh, embossing a reed slot does. It, it sharpens the edge of the, uh, of the reed and um, this, this uh, improves the response and, uh, and it's, it's actually had a chance uh, when I was at, at the factory in Germany once, spent an afternoon with Eberhard Glunz who was the materials engineer at Honer at the time and he had a, a clever setup that he rigged up. Uh, Honer has a has a kind of a box with a pump on it. They call it a blas machine, a blow a blow machine. It's a big box, and they can hook harmonicas up to it, and and it just blows them continuously. And they use it to test uh, reed durability, how long it takes reeds, how many hours they can get before the reed will. will uh, fail on you. And what uh, Eberhardt had done was to the to the blow machine he had hooked up an uh, oscilloscope and a computer and hooked it up to the switch so that when he flipped the switch for the pump the the oscilloscope and computer would measure uh, how many milliseconds it would take to go from zero air pressure to maximum volume where it would plateau out and what the amplitude, what the volume would be in decibels. So the, the x-axis was milliseconds and the y-axis was uh, decibels. So what we did, and the other cool thing he had was that he had a rigged up that he could take as many tests of the one read at a time and the computer would take an average in case there was any variation in the way the pump worked or whatever. So we, uh, we hooked up a um, marine band replay and uh, tested a read ten times to get to get a good picture of, of what the what the uh, response time was because this would give you in milliseconds from zero volume zero air pressure to maximum volume um, and once we had that we took it off and I champered the read and we put it straight back on and tested it again ten times now I was expecting the response to improve because I could notice that myself at which it did but but I was surprised that it also provided greater volume, so louder and, and faster response from chamfering the reed. So I'll show you now how I chamfer the reed. Um, and what I actually will use is uh, this uh, reed chisel right here. And I'll show you later on, uh, I'll show you later on uh, how, uh, how to make this out of an old file. So let's transfer the the um, camera down here. Give me a moment while I set up here. Now is there not a zoom? There we go. Okay. We've got this. I've been practicing camera angles all day, so so we should be able to get this right now. Okay, um, so I'm going to be working on two reeds, and 
one, a low one and a high one, just to show you the the uh, uh, the difference in the techniques. So uh, right now we have a high read, and I'm going to work on this read here. So what I do is I, I take a, a read slip. This is this is, uh, I think it's 2000 uh, feeler gauge. Stick that underneath like that. And take the uh, chisel and, oh, hang on one second. One other thing I do is I put on a second pair of reading glasses over the first one. This gives me a little bit better magnification. It's, it's there we go. Now I'm ready to go. You can all see there, okay. And just, you see a little burr, and then here. This is at about a 45 degree angle. You don't want to take it all the way down to the bottom because you don't want to, uh, uh, compromise the the actual uh, t tolerance between the reed and the slot. So, but just a nice little. Okay, there's that reed, and then we're going to do this little reed here. Same again. Am I in camera? And then on the weight as well. Tip it I'm not going all the way to the end because you don't want to catch the catch the tip of the reed to damage the reed. So I'm starting about a millimeter or less back from the top and then turn it around and finish it off like this. And like this. In the end. Okay, that's the reed chamfered now, and you can you can kind of see if I can catch the light in it. You'll see the bright edge there. There it is coming up. Okay, that's the chamfering. Um, now. Uh, uh, next step after that, let me go back over here. Flip it around here. Okay. Um, next step will be uh, the embossing. Now, um, a reed slot embossing is a is a technique that I that I came up with back in the 1970s when uh, a friend had given me a copy of a, a manual on the American reed organ and working on it and in it it showed some drawings of, of uh, unusual reeds, specialized reeds and uh, this would be about in the, in the mid late 1970s I was out here in Ireland and uh, so I spent a, an afternoon making one of these reeds and here's the reed here, a trident shaped reed. And I only had drill and file and uh, uh, and a hacksaw to, to make this thing. And uh, by the time I got finished, it wasn't too bad, but the reed to slot tolerance was, was kind of wide. And uh, I said, I'm not going to make another one of these because I probably wouldn't do any better job at it. So that's when I came up with the idea of kind of uh, burnishing or embossing the slot edge to draw it in on it. And it worked, worked good. So I'll let you hear it. And 
I had set it in one of my accordions for a while, a fine big sound. Um, so fast forward almost 20 years to uh, about 1995, I'm working at Honer, and at that time the reed to slot tolerance in uh, some of the harmonicas, particularly the, the Richter classic, the Marine bands, uh, was getting pretty wide and the harmonicas were getting quite hard to play. Um, people were sending them back, players were sending them back, and there was only a few customizers working back then, but they were sending them back. And uh, we, uh, we uh, started on a project to improve the, the reed plate tooling and the reeds, but in the meantime we had to deal with all these returns and frustrated uh, customers. So that's when I thought of this, this uh, technique I'd used on this Trident reed back in the 70s. And uh, so I tried it out and it worked pretty good. So I, I showed the technique to, to Sissy and uh, for the next few weeks we were embossing the returns from players and customizers just to improve it and keep them going. Um, and it, uh, once I was pretty sure that it was working well, I started telling folks about it, telling, telling some of the players and customizers about it, and it took off pretty quickly, and, and it's, uh, it's kind of established itself as a kind of a standard practice with, uh, with harmonica technicians these days. So um, there's uh, the one thing about embossing, and it's uh, similar to the uh, chamfering, it does it's, uh, embossing a reed slot actually does two things. It, it narrows the, the tolerance, it closes the, closes the reed slot closer to the reed, but it also puts a sharp burr, like a sharp edge. And this sharp burr is actually as, 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 as important an effect on the performance of the reed as the, as the closing of the tolerance. Um, and it's, it's well known in, in other free reed uh, uh, um, uh, types, uh, including the, the jaw harp that I played earlier. You can see on the jaw harp that the, the frame, which would, we'd call a reed slot, is very narrow. You see, it's only a sharp edge there. Um, actually, some of the Norwegian uh, jaw harps are so sharp, the, the, the inside edges of the reed frame and the edges of the reed slot, they're so sharp that you can actually cut yourself. But they're great harmonicas. I mean, the great uh, jaw harps. Uh, but the thing is, with the jaw harp, what you want to do is increase the upper parcels, the harmonics, as much as possible, because that's where you get the melody. Uh, the fundamental on this thing is an, an octave, down in the lower octave, and it's just a drone. And the melody is played up with these upper parcels, like. So that really sharp sound where you put a strong harmonics is what you want in a jaw harp. With the harmonica, it's kind of a trade-off. The closer you get, you know, with with uh, with the with the tolerance and with putting these sharp edges on the reed and on the reed slot, the more you're you are increasing or amplifying these upper partials, and and that affects the tone. Uh, you might like it or you might like it, but it's it you you lose a lot of the mid-range of the sound. And uh, and uh, you know, a friend of mine, a well-known harmonica player, was uh, doing a recording session in Nashville some years back. And uh, he was using a, a customized harp that had very closely um, embossed reed slots. And the engineer uh, said the sound is, is too harsh, too, too thin. And so he, he took out just a stock Special 20 and it had that warm sound the engineer wanted. So, so when you are, when you're thinking about uh, embossing and chamfering, uh, how far you want to go, uh, bear in mind is going to affect the tone as well. So you might want to sort of find some happy medium between tone and and response uh, when you're deciding how far to go. Now, uh, there's two ways I have to go about this, and I'll show you. Now, um, if I'm working on a 
reed plate that's uh, got a fairly wide tolerance, then I'll, I'll want to work right close and, uh, let me see, where's my tool? Um, this isn't it. Oh, my tool isn't handy, but it's, it's something like, it'll be something like this that I'll use. And uh, I'll want to emboss all the way back. This light box has a light inside it. You see that? And I have various inserts that I can change, unscrew these, to fit different size reed plates, and the biggest one that will fit a 16-hole chromatic. Um, so uh, I'll use this if, if I need to have a very close embossed reed slot, or like I say, if, if the tolerance between the tongue and the slot is not great, and I want to kind of close it up again, that's what I'll use. Um, but other than that, and what we'll be doing tonight is uh, the, the harmonica that I'm working with is actually not a bad uh, read to slot tolerance. So I'm going to use a different technique. And what I use is, where is it now? This here. is a, a, a reed slip. It's a reed lifter. It's what I use to, this end. I use to adjust the, the offset of the reeds. And I use the back. That's that's a fairly wide radius, I'd say. I say it looks like about a looks like about a um, almost a ten millimeter radius. And this is made out of a of a one point five millimeter reed plate. So it's fairly thick and I've polished this edge here. And I'll use that. Now you can't go all the way back. So what I use, what I do here, is uh, I'll take a small piece of shim stock and I'll place it under the reed like that. And what this does, that protects. If, if you were to if you were to push this all the way back, you'd end up bending the reed down into the slot that you don't want to do. So you want to kind of protect this end. And as you're going here, you can actually feel where the uh, where this reed slip is, and that and that helps keep the thing from going down too far. And you can get fairly far back doing this. So I'll I'll do this and I'll show you there, like this. Just run it in. like that um, and uh, and then if, depending on how close you want to go you can hold it up to the light you know like I showed you earlier to see do you have clearance do you have room to go a little further um, if you should go if I should go too far and some of the reed uh, catches which this might be doing let me see here raise it up a little Okay, so it's, it's catching just just a little bit. Let me uh, let me see. Show you what I'm do doing now. I'll hold it up to the light, like I showed you. And uh, one way to take care of that is I have a uh, an a exacto knife. You with a I I cut off the blade, left just the haft of the knife in there and set in a little piece of one thousandth feeler gauge and with that I can just set it in and run it in a little bit like that. That was around there that I thought it was catching so that might have just taken care of it. Let's see how it sounds. Sometimes just plucking it. There you go. And sometimes if it's only a slight bit of a burr on it, if you just pluck it a few times, that might clear it. But uh, if it's a little more, you can do this. If it's and uh, if it's even worse, you may have to get in with a with a blade and kind of from the underside and scrape a little. But uh, that's that's that one embossed. Um, 
and then I'll do this one here while I'm at it. This is the other read we'll be working on. Okay. see is there any questions uh, I'm having trouble playing this video is everyone seeing me let me see hope we're hope we're there the laptop I have here okay okay um, People are saying the videos are okay. Everyone okay? All right. I'm having trouble. I'll try this again. Give me a second here. Let me load up. Oh, sorry. We're having trouble playing this video. Okay. Hopefully, you can you can see me. Um, okay. I'm getting the uh, I'm getting the, the messages. That's the main thing. Okay. Cool. So that's the uh, that's the embossing. And the next oh darn, I didn't turn the soldering iron. The next uh, the next thing I, I will do is actually solder the reeds because you can see I'll have to talk about it a little bit while the soldering iron warms up. Sorry about that. Um, now the the thing about harmonica reeds, you know that that if you if you uh, remove material from the tip, you're going to raise the pitch. If you remove material from from the root, you're going to lower the pitch. So the question is, where along the length is the point at which, if you remove material, there'll be uh, no change in pitch? So some years back, I did a test of this with small reeds and big reeds. And I found that on reeds that don't have weights or that have only small weights, the point at which material removal will not change the pitch of the reed is not halfway, as you might expect, but two thirds of the way from the root, one third of the way from the tip. So right here, one third is, is the, like the null point. And this is important to know when you're when you're uh, working on reeds, especially when you're you're going to be doing a major retuning of a reed if you want to change the note, uh, a semitone or more, as where you want to work from, uh, uh, because you want to try and maintain an even profile along it. And a little later, I'll show you a chart of some various reed profiles. But uh, um, so when I'm when I'm soldering, I, I try if it's a major solder, I'll try and stay within within one third of the way of the tip. Now this is your low A, and it is so low that I had to cheat a little further. It's about about a one and a half millimeters back beyond the one third mark. Uh, but this is. Uh, it's it's uh, actually this gives you the maximum amount of the flexing because the reed the the sort of the the part of the reed that does most of the flexing is the back part of the reed and reeds don't actually work like a uh, pendulum they don't swing back and forth through the reed slot like a pendulum they coil and uncoil through the slot more like a clock spring. Uh, so you need, and that that uh, that's, that spring has to have an even uh, curve as you bend it. So uh, knowing if I want to if I want to uh, raise the pitch of a reed by a semitone, I'm not going to just take material from the very tip. I'm going to work with all the one third distance, so I have an even even sort of thickness as I go along. Likewise, if I'm lowering the pitch, I won't just file there or there, 
I'll work all the way over two thirds of the way. And of course, removing material here is going to affect, is going to have a greater effect than removing material here. Same here. It has less of an effect as you're moving back and less of an effect as you're moving forward there so as you go towards the point where there's no change in pitch. So when I, uh, when I am soldering a reed, what I try to do is I, I will first of all, especially with draw reeds, if you're having a big weight on it, I will, I will, uh, let's see. Get this up here. Okay, you can see, you can see here that the, the very tip, I, I chamfer that edge there because especially on draw reeds, that's the, that's the point that's going to kick the cover if it swings too far. So I, I give myself clearance right there. And then um, I start removing material. Uh, and I want to take as much weight off it as I can. So I start removing solder from here to tune it up. So you can see how these are all sloped. They're, they're thinner here than they are here. Same as that, all the way up. These are all thinner at this point. The maximum height is at this point, which is back from the very tip to give you that clearance um, so that you have as, as little weight on it as possible that is needed. Uh, and then there's the next step after that when you start profiling the reed. But um, that's, uh, that's uh, the, way I'll, the way I'll do it. Uh, uh, now, the first thing I'll do, I'll work on the solder might be, the soldering iron might be hot enough now. Okay, we're going to work on this reed. Uh, now, if you're soldering, you want to have a nice bright surface. So you uh, start off, you want to clean any kind of uh, 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 material or corrosion or, or, or verdigree or anything that's on the reed. So you get nice bright metal and you go back as much as, as far as you think you're going to need. Now I know that the last reed was there, so this is going to be a little bit less, I guess. So I'm just going to scrape it. Yeah, nice bright metal there. Okay, you see how that's bright there now. Uh, next thing I do is take a pencil and I'll make a mark where I don't want the solder to go beyond. The graphite tends to resist the solder, so make your line there and then along the edges as well. Okay. And then the next step is a bit of, uh, I use a little bit of flux. So I'll put just the tiniest drop of flux on it. There's your, there's your flux there. Tiny bit of flux. Just that. And then uh, you don't want to use a metal support like I have here because that will that will draw act as a heat sink and draw the heat away which you don't want so at this point I'll take that out and I'll put a slip of paper in like that and with these uh, these uh, smaller reeds where you don't need much solder what I'll actually do is I will cut a little piece of solder I'm going to cut a little bit of solder here. How much do I think I'm going to need? That's plenty. That's probably probably too much. I'm going to give myself a little bit less. A little more. Okay, try that. I'll set it on that the little bit of flux that I have there will help it stick so you can see that the solder is sitting on like that now normally when you're when you when you're soldering 
you're supposed to to warm up the the workpiece rather than the solder. Uh, but in and, and these reeds, they're so thin that it takes no time at all for the uh, the solder to melt and heat up the reed itself and melt. So I'm hoping this soldering iron is going to be hot enough now. Because of, oh, the other thing I do is I'll take a take a, like a a file and. Uh, to raise this up a little bit so that it's going to be tending to, uh, there you go, so that you have a bit of a slope on it. There we go. And we'll give it a try. Okay. Then uh, clean off the extra bit of flux. Now what we want, we want to uh, turn this on, tune it on, we want, uh, this should be a D, D2, so this is, that'll be, that'll be an octave above this one, that's your D, right, that's good, that's about a semitone below. Uh, the, the note that I want, which is just perfect. So now we can put put this back in, or actually I might even use a, a heavier reed slip. Let's see. Where is that thing? There we go. Here's a here's a heavier reed slip that I'm going to use. And then we file it down. Um, when I'm when I'm filing solder, I'll only use one file because the solder will get stuck in the teeth. So so I just I, I do all my solder filing just with this one file, so I don't mess up my other ones. So um, start off here. We needn't worry so much about putting that that uh, that uh, chamfer that that bevel down on that in because these small reeds don't go so far. But what I want to maintain is the aerodynamic of the reeds. So I, I will actually curve the the solder because I want to keep that that uh, that sort of the edge on it. So when I'm doing it, let me put my glasses back on. Okay. And then for the tip, you don't want to you don't want to file in this direction because you can catch the end of it and destroy the reeds. So for the very tip, what I do is I'll just run the file backwards, and the solder is soft enough that, that you take you take it out of a fair bit, all right, and you're not running the risk of damaging the reeds. So I go like that, and on the side, check it. Okay, that's a little bit sharp, which is just about perfect, because we're going to be profiling the reed back here, and that's going to drop it down. So that'll that'll do fine for now. Um, and before I do that, before I put the soldering iron away, let me do the other reed. Now this one, um, this is actually uh, what do we have here? This is going to be a D. I have another reed. Now the interesting thing about these old uh, soloists, they use the same type of reed as the, the Richter Classic, as the Marine Band, which is only 10 holes. And the way they manage that is that the first two reeds, let me see, I'm out of sight here, sorry about that. The first two reeds are actually the same length. Reeds, reeds two through 11 correspond in size to the regular long slot key of C marine band and then uh, reads read 12 is the same length as read 11 so these two are the same length and these two are the same length 
So what I want is uh, the, uh, this is going to be a D, and that's actually the same note as, as this D here. Same on the other read, play the second read. That, or are we here? That there is your read, read two, is the same length as read one, and that's the same note that I want, so I can use that as a guide for how long, how much I want to uh, put solder on the other one. So, same again, we clean it. Uh, any recommendations on the type of solder to use? Anything more preferable than others? Well, if you can get uh, lead-free silver solder, um, then you don't have to worry about the, the lead. Not that you necessarily need to worry about it anyway, but but uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, it, may, it might be that silver solder uh, might have a slightly higher melting point. Um, uh, so, but, uh, like I say, silver solder, and, and it's, I, I think, uh, I don't think, to be honest, once the solder, if, with lead solder, once the solder's on, my, I, I can't see that there's going to be much, uh, migration from the reed into you, you're not touching it, uh, but, uh, if you're concerned at all, just get some silver solder. Uh, question, I'd like to see the tip, um, okay, this is the tip here, and I've sharpened it. Where am I? There we go. Because I want to f focus the uh, the point, and also um, it's important uh, after every soldering to clean the clean. I use a bit of uh, sandpaper, just to, that helps keep it sharp and clean. But you want to get that carbon off of it every time, otherwise it's not going to work so well melting it. So. So I've cleaned it up a little bit there. Now, um, any other questions I missed? Uh, how far down could you lower a reed with solder? Well, Ashin, uh, in this case, this is going from uh, middle C, this, 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 uh, um, uh, which one, this one here, is going from middle C to A, an octave below middle C. That's 15 semitones down. That's that, and it's not. It's really not that. Um, it's not that sort of drastic a, a proposition because even Honer will have way more than an octave different notes that they can obtain out of reeds of the same length. So, but in this case, we're going 15 uh, semitones down. But it'll be more than just solder to make it work properly. Like I say, after we get the solder on, we will need to be um, profiling it. So I'm missing any other questions. Uh, um, comment 81, comments. Hang on a second, I see. Uh, where are you? OK. Um, I've only seen a few. Alrighty, any case. Um, so, once again, next step, put on the pencil line and on the sides as well. There, this, this pencil trick, I forget the fellow's name, but one of the regulars on Harpel, uh, who I think works as a dental uh, technician or something, he's the one that uh, that uh, posted this this cool trick on Harpel years and years ago. It was a great, sorry I forgot your name, but it's a great trick and I never forgot it. Okay, um, then put our flux on. Am I still in camera? Yeah. Now, when I've got this much soldered, and it's going to be a lot of solder I'm putting on it. Uh, I don't bother cutting it off. I'll just work from the actual coil of solder. 
So here we go. Trying to stay out of the camera view when I'm working here. There's a there's a fella, uh, Frank I think Prentinso, I think is his name, that uh, he's, he owns a few restaurants in, in New York City, and uh, uh, which my daughter goes to all the time, and, and uh, he posts uh, all his recipes on Instagram, and that guy that guy makes all these great Italian dishes with one hand because he's holding the camera, he's holding his iPhone and his left hand and doing everything one handed so so I shouldn't complain here. Um, okay, let me clean this off and see uh, we had to get the Now, is it quite likely with all this so much solder that the sides are going to be catching on the reed? Let's see. So, at this point, I take my chisel, stick this under, let me see here, I want to keep in, keep in view here, uh, where are we, okay, that'll work, now, and take the chisel, and you start working. Now, to remove the solder, is that, let me come in there, let me get back in view here. Okay. You see, I'm just chiseling away the solder. Now, when you're doing this, be sure that you keep your chisel at an angle, because once again, you don't want to take any of the brass off of the reed itself. You're just, you're just, you have it tilted up a little bit and you're just taking the solder away like that. Working like that. And if you look very closely, and like I say, I've got uh, two pairs of glasses on now, my prescription and a pair of uh, drugstore reading glasses over that to give me a little more magnification. But you can, you can kind of see, but if you look carefully, if there's any solder that's actually on the edge of the reed itself. Just work it like that, and then the other side. Where am I now? Here. Talking about the uh, the lead. Um, some years back, uh, and I think it's. People seem to be allergic to a lot more things these days than in the old days. And it's been thought that it's just sort of cumulative. If when our environment is filled with more and more um, uh, toxic or, or unnatural, or not unnatural, but unfamiliar substances that our body is not used to. And as they, one or the other might be a, a problematic on its own, but when we when we fill the, our environment with all kinds of things which we have done, and then people start developing allergies to these kind of things, and uh, there we go. That's working fine now. So uh, we started getting this would be around the same time in the 90s. People started uh, complaining about getting nickel allergy, nickel nickel rash or nickel dermatitis from our harmonica covers because the old harmonica covers were were made of uh, nickel plated steel um, soft steel blech was the, was the term they called it um, and, and so it was basically it was pure nickel that was that was um, uh, plated on the steel and that was definitely causing a lot of people to have uh, um, uh, a reaction so we had to look for uh, replacements 
And um, one of the things that we ascertained was that nickel that's contained within an alloy, say if you're using a, a, a any kind of a chrome or any kind of a um, stainless steel or anything like that that has nickel in it as part of the alloy, it is bound in the alloy and won't migrate. And so people shouldn't be allergic to it. And it's only when you have pure nickel that's actually on the cover that you can get it. So we had to, we had to work around for a long time and we, we ended up going to stainless steel. And it was tricky for a while because stainless steel is way tougher than, um, than the, the soft, uh, soft steel nickel plated that we were using. And some of the harmonica cover designs were very intricate, like the marine band, especially the the and the bottom cover, all those little metals, and also the the 270 super chromonica, um, and they were afraid they were going to have to drastically simplify this artwork, which would have been kind of uh, sad to see this all this beautiful old artwork go. But it was they couldn't they couldn't just change use the same tooling on with these uh, stainless steel cover materials because it would wear the tooling out in no time. Uh, but the finally, somebody over there figured out all they had to do was they had to plate the tooling with a thin layer of titanium. And that's what they did, and which is much tougher than the stainless steel. And that, that allowed them to, to uh, preserve all the old, lovely, intricate artwork on these harmonica covers and still switch to stainless steel. So anyway, I digress. So here we are. This is, this is the right... Uh, I mean, it's, it's working now, but let's see that I put enough on it. Where are we? I want, I want uh, an E. Okay, that's that's a little bit higher, but I might be able to get away with that because the next step is going to be uh, the profiling. So I'll just leave that for now, and I might have to add a little more solder in a little while, but we'll just. We'll just try it as is. Um, so uh, profiling is the uh, is the next stage. Let me take it back here. Um, where's my flip it around? Okay. All right. Um, now. Uh, like I say, the the reed has to have a, a certain flexibility, and it can't be too stiff a reed uh, because it, it, the reed doesn't swing. Like I say, like a pendulum, it coils and uncoils like a clock spring. Uh, now uh, there was a fellow named Manfred Haug was the uh, export manager for Honor Germany when I was working there. And Manfred was, he was a third generation Honor employee. And as a child, uh, he'd sit at his mother's knee as she tuned harmonica reed plates, because in those days, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the workers were actually farmers and uh, did a lot of the, the work at home and then, and then went into the factory to deliver it. And this, this, this process of, of having a lot of the workers spread out all over the region doing the, the piece work and then bringing them in to Tressingen was caused for uh, Matthias Honer, the founder, was, was responsible for apparently the first, one of the first railways in Europe. And it was it's a it was a sort of a little tram that's still running today that was to bring in the workers and 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 their work from the outlying region. So uh, Manfred's uh, mother tuned harmonicas at home. His father tuned accordions, and his grandfather Friedrich Haug tuned the first marine bands back in 1896. So he was he was a third generation Honer man, and he told me once that uh, uh, Jakob Honer one of the sons of the founder uh, at, at one point was, was in charge of production. And every morning when he would arrive at work, the first place he would go to was where they were making the reeds. 
and uh, he had this little hand vise that they still use today, kind of a little pin vise that they used to to fix a reed in it and pluck the reed and see how it see how it uh, how it plays. And and uh, Jacob would say to the workers every morning, he'd say, "Boys, make me soft reeds, mach mir weiche Zungen." So. Uh, that's, that was really important to have a f good flexibility in the reeds. Um, and the other thing that, uh, that, they, that they, still use, they still do today, the workers that are making the reeds, especially the accordion reeds, when they're setting up a machine to, to mill the reed material and they'll stamp the reeds out, they'll stamp out some tests and they'll actually take the reed and they'll bend it all the way down like that. Now you would never use a reed that you've bent that far, but they will look at the curvature to see, like remember how I said you want a nice even curve in it. They'll look at the curvature by bending it right down like that and see does it need to be have any adjustments. If there's any areas where there's too much of a of a bend, then they might need to tilt the the, the cutting tool just to get a nice a nice curvature. So that's what they do. Make me soft reeds. Um, so what we uh, what we have right now, we have this. Uh, um, let's see, uh, where am I, um, okay, let me, uh, oh yeah, so we're talking about, we're talking about, uh, profiles, so right about in, uh, around about 95 when we were having a bit of, that bit of trouble with, uh, with our, with our reads, there was a big program to improve both the, the, uh, reeds and the reed slots. So we did a study on some old harmonicas. We had four marine bands basically from different periods. Now, uh, the uh, starting with a, a harmonica that was that uh, that I had in, in the shop that was from roughly around 1910, sent that back. And we also had at the time uh, qu uh, quite a few in stock pieces of the Herb Schreiner harmonica, which was basically a marine band with different covers, and that was a signature model that that was made around 1958. And we had a lot of those in stock, so I, I sent a dozen of them back to Germany for them to test and take apart and you know work on. So we had that one from around 1910. One from around um, 1958. We had a sample from uh, a 1985 production, and then we had the current production, which was uh, 1995. And they they were actually able to measure and chart the profile of these reeds. Um, now that you can see the the uh, the four different ones are superimposed. The red one is from 1995, the red line. The green line is from 1985. The uh, uh, black line is from 1958, and the blue line is from around 1910. You can see all along there, you have this even, even profile. That's that's uh, f that's the uh, blow reads, re reads one through ten, going all the way down to to. The, tenth hole and your draw reads. Now there's one interesting thing when you look at this chart, especially down at the low end, you'll see that the red 1995 and the green 1985 reads are thicker. See, this is your, your rivet is here. These are the free and these are the weights on the end. By the way, this, this chart, they have magnified the the vertical axis by 10. This is actually 10 times thicker than it really was, and that they've done that so you can actually see the, the profile in it. But um, the uh, the later production, the 1985 and 1995, are thinner back here and thicker here. Same as that here. See that? Thinner here, thicker here. And uh, I think that's because when some of these early harmonicas, we tested the hardness, and these older reeds were actually softer reeds. Um, 
and with the later later reed material, um, they, they 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 were basically forced to use uh, harder material. They couldn't get the softer material that would really work right. So they had to to get the correct pitch. They actually had to make the reeds thinner here and thicker here to lower the pitch. You see that? And these the 1910 and the 1958 are about the same. So, but point being that you want this nice even, nice even uh, curvature to the reeds. So uh, we're going to profile reeds as the next step. questions okay now now um, in, in accordion reeds the uh, the best handmade reeds they actually stamp the individual reed out before the reed is being profiled, before the, 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 reed, the profile has been milled into the reed. And uh, they actually, the, it, it, I was at the, uh, there's a, a good quality uh, Italian accordion reed made by a company called Benci, and I visited their factory back in the 80s. And they actually stamp two reeds out back to back, like, where am I? Uh, so that the, the 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 rivet pads are actually connected, and then they'll mount the these reeds on a drum, uh, so that and, and rotate the drum, and then they'll mill the or grind the profile into the reed, and so the top of the reed actually has the same radius as the drum. The object being, you don't want a flat. Sur top surface. It's all part of this aerodynamics. Once again, you want to have a, a kind of a curvature to it. Uh, and and one of the reasons that I'll use a higher pitch reed that I could say I could use a much lower pitch reed. And in fact, I could use I could use a reed, say a Thunderbird reed from the Honer Thunderbird, which is the same size reed and it's exactly the pitch that I want. But the problem you have there the problem that Honer has there. This here is a Thunderbird reed. Uh, where am I here? Okay, uh, bu, 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 bu. there we go. Is that uh, they're limited by by the thickness of the reed material, and they they in order to get the the pitch of the reed down where they need it, they have to put this extremely long weight on it. And they couldn't really do anything else because any thicker of a of a reed tongue would just wear the this the reed tools out in no time. So they, and this is actually this is actually uh, I think this reed material is is, is uh, might be like a 1.5. It's, it's it's the thickest that I've seen them use. Um, so, but in order to get the 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 uh, the pitch, they've got to both file the, uh, uh, send the reed weight all the way back to here, leaving only this amount of area that can flex. And they have to grind that down fairly thin, this area here, just to get it to play. Um, that leaves the reed, uh, it's, it's not the optimal design for a reed. It's, it's the best that they could do with, with, the, with the restrictions, but you have, you see the difference here. These are the same, the same, or am I here? The same read. Um, how am I going to do this? Okay. Uh, give me a second to line this up. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, there we go. 
same reed, size, same note. But with, with this way, you have a much greater area. And you can have a, a you don't have to grind it down so far. Uh, but the thing is, and, and, and I can show you the difference that it makes. When you have this, this extremely short um, area, then the reed is not all that stable, especially in terms of pitch stability. So uh, here's a low A. I'll play this. This is the low A. I'm, I'm actually going to block the, the, the draw note with my thumb. So I'm going to isolate the blow note and play that for you. And actually you can hear if, if I start playing, as I start playing soft, it plays fine. As I increase more, try to get more volume out of it, the pitch goes down and the reed actually uh, hangs up eventually when I'm blowing hard enough. Uh, but when I do the same thing with this reed here, as hard as I play it, it's still going to hold its pitch much better and and it won't it won't hang up on you. So that's that's the reason that I've I've chosen this reed rather than swapping it out. And the other thing with this extra thickness because I do want to make the reed a little more flexible than it is uh, to begin with. So where are we here now? Uh, um, um, okay, so for profiling it, I'll use the, once again, the chisel. And I'll start working back. But I am starting from the edge and then slowly working it in. And then on this side. But I'm not taking any material off the very, the very center. I'm leaving that on um, the original thickness so that I'm putting this slight radius on the reed. Once again, on this side. I'm out of camera, sorry. Where am I? Okay. Look, this one here. Now you can see here that I've left the, the center unchanged like that. And then this is going to, once again, this is going to drop the pitch considerably. So now you start working on the um, solder again to bring it back up to pitch. Like that, work it up. Um, so we're kind of... Moving on, it's almost 10 past 8, and I think there's a 90-minute limit on these um, live streams on Facebook. So, but what I'll do at this point is, once I get it back up to pitch, I will see how it responds. Now, the, the thinner I make the reed, the more I take off the back, or am I against, uh, the, more I, the more I take off of here, the more I can take off of here and the more flexible the reed is going to be. Um, and once again, it's a trade-off. Uh, how much flexibility for response and ease of playing as opposed to um, the strength of the sound, the, the stability of the pitch. And that's another thing that you, that you, uh, that you, uh, you, you have to determine yourself. It's kind of a subjective thing, how far you want to take this. Okay, that's that now. Um, before it gets too late, I want to show you about the reed chisel, how I make the chisel, and Patrice 
Uh, you asked the question, did you make the chisel yourself? Yes, and I'll show you now how I do it. This is this is uh, from an old worn out read file, just like just like these, right? Um, and this is how I do it. Let me take you over here. do is I'll take file and I'll put it in you can see where the uh, where the teeth ends right right there I'll put it in and you, you determine what what kind of an angle you want on the, on the chisel but at the moment more or less I just take the same angle there Oops, no, that's not the way. Put it in this way. Just like that. So that's sticking out at the angle that I want. And then, oops, you can focus. Focus. Okay. And then I just take a hammer. Hammer and break it off. Just just tap it with a hammer to break it off. Um, so that's broken off. And then, once that's broken off, I will take the, uh, the broken bit, which would be looking like this now, and I would raise it up so that it's just a little bit, just a little proud of the surface. Like that, just just slightly proud. Where are we? Right, right there. There's your file. Can you see that? Yeah. Move that in a little bit. All right, just slightly proud. And I'll take an emery stone. All right, stone. Zoom out. Hang on, uh, get back. Now, take my stone and then just work it back and forth until it's nice and flush. Okay. And then once that's perfectly flush and you don't feel it with the stone, then you could take it out and, and then it's fairly sharp at this point, but you can make it you can make it sharper by, this is the way, uh, my dad was a, a cabinet maker and uh, this is how he used to sharpen his chisels. They were, his, his chisels were a little bit bigger than, than, uh, than this chisel. But uh, here's a handy little trick. This stuff is, you can buy this stuff, it's for big sheets of it, for or our, big sheets of it for putting under rugs so they don't slip but uh, I just lay that on there and you could set the, the stone on it and it, it won't it won't it won't uh, it won't um, move when you're sharpening it um, I like to use a bit of spit as a lubricant on this uh, it works really good and and uh, there's a the old uh, retired tool maker Eric Albus works for me at, at home or in the uh, accordion department. Uh, he was from uh, Obendorf, was a village in the is a village in the Black Forest near where the Horner factory is, and uh, he uh, he trained there. And he said that when he would be working there, that uh, when they were having to make a piece on the lathe, that uh, the foreman would insist that they use oil as a lubricant, but they would only use oil. When he was there, when he wasn't there, they would lubricate the workpiece on the lathe with their spit, and they said they got a much, much better polish from it. So, 
I put a bit of spit on it and then sharpen it by, this is how my dad sharpened chisels, just moving it on in the one direction like that. Okay. And then once you have it as where you want it, then you just give one pass only to remove the burr like that. And then on the sides, on the other side. And that's how I sharpen it. You get a nice, nice, a nice sharp edge out of it. That's the that's sharpening the chisel. Um, right. Now, I don't really have a whole lot of time to get into to tuning. We might have to, we might have to uh, do that on another time, but I'll just show you basically some of the tools that I use in tuning. Uh, I use a file, put this back here. Let's get a scrap replay here. Hang on one second. Okay, here's just a scrap replay. Um, so the tools I I use are a file like this. Um, and uh, a scratcher. Basically, that's it. Um, this is for fine tuning now. Oh, the other thing I was going to tell you, when you're when you're doing this rough, when you're doing this profiling, right? Uh, and you give it its first rough tune, uh, you it, leave it a few cents, maybe six or seven cents flat over where you want the note to be, because when you when you're profiling a reed and removing material from the entire surface of the reed, like I've been doing, um, it's the surface of the reed that develops the work hardening, right? Where the tension builds up, and not not the strain, but the actual the tension that, that that develops it as a natural function of it being moved. When you take that off, then it's going to take some time for the reed to build back that surface tension. And as it builds this tension up, it will raise in pitch. And it's usually around around six, seven cents or so, I find, that it, that it goes up. So rough tune it to there. But this is more like for fine tuning now. Uh, once again, for lowering the pitch, let me take it up here. All right. Zoom in a little bit. Okay, uh, we're lowering the pitch. You can work from from two thirds of the way out. Can you all see that? From two thirds of the way out, all the way back here. Now, uh, if it's if I have to lower it quite a bit, you know, if I got maybe eight, nine, ten, fifteen cents or so that I want to lower it, I might start way back here. So you can kind of zoom in a little more, not as much as I can zoom in. Start back here at nearly the, maybe halfway, it wouldn't go all the way to the two thirds because you're not taking anything out. Um, just back here and make your scratch. Now the advantage, you see that scratch there that I put in? See that there? The advantage of doing using this as opposed to a file is that the, you're removing a minimum amount of that surface, which is where the tension is built up. If you're if you're going to file along the whole surface of the reed there to lower it, then then the reed is going to rise in pitch you know, over the course of a few days or a week. So you you're you're kind of affecting the the uh, uh, the, the surface as as little as possible, um, and then. When you get into just fine tuning, if I'm just going to do just a couple of cents, you know, I might just start here, just a couple, a short little mark there. That's for lowering the pitch. For raising the pitch, once again, just using the file, just filing like that. Always bearing bearing in mind, keeping that radius like that. Now, um, when you're, when if you have to raise the pitch of one of these really high reeds, I would, I don't go, I don't 
tune it like this because it's very easy to catch that tip of the reed in the file. And what I'll actually do, I'll use the scraper and just scrape in the other direction, in this direction. This is fine tuning only, right? Um, what that might, however, do is raise a little bit of a burr on the end. So you may need to kind of deburr it, sort of knock that burr off. Um, so that's, those are the tools I use for raising and lowering the pitch and fine tuning. And the other thing that I want to show you, uh, maybe later on, where are we, is the, um, the tuner. Now this, uh, this tuner app is uh, from Peterson, the folks that make the, the stroboscope tuner. And uh, it's really good, it's really accurate to within uh, one-tenth of a cent. Not, uh, but, but the great thing is one of their in-app purchases is their uh, harmonic tuning uh, um, add-on or, or, or upgrade. And what that does, each of these bands is the harmonic. This, this first one will be your fundamental, first partial, second partial, third, fourth, fifth partial. Um, and that can be really valuable when you're tuning. If you want to say, uh, have a little bit of a stretch octave, you want to have a nice, nicely in tune, uh, what I will do on the low reeds, I will actually tune the low reeds to the second bar. Now they, they say you want to tune to the brightest one, uh, but, but if I tune the lowest reeds to the second bar, because they don't quite match always, and then the same note an octave higher, I'll tune to the low bar. That means that that the 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 two reeds, the 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 high reed is going to be right in tune with the second partial, with the first harmonic of the low reed, and that that's a really nice way to sweeten the tuning and to stretch the tuning a little bit. Uh, accordion uh, tuners can tell you about uh, stretching the reed. If you if you tune an octave in a perfect octave, then uh, sometimes that higher pitched reed is going to be lost. You want to kind of stretch it a little bit and that not so much that you really hear a beat, but just that little bit that brightens up that higher note and you get a better kind of a sound. Um, and there's other cool things that you can do with the uh, this harmonic tuning in that purchase. So I, I recommend it. I, I've used, I used a, a real uh, stroboscope tuner at home for years and years and this thing is, I have to say, every bit is good and you don't have that the harmonic tuning facility that you have uh, on the on the app here. So, well worth the money. The Peterson I Strobo Soft is called. Okay, I think we're we're just about there, just about out of time. Now, um, Kyle said this is a Honer service kit tool. This one here, are you probably referring to? Yeah, that that uh, that scratcher is is where are we? Uh, come back. I don't see it here. Uh, hold on. Why don't I see us? Um, look at oh, sorry. Here, there. That's the uh, that's the scratcher that they include. What I usually use is the uh, the one the uh, accordion scratchers that they use in the factory. This is this is. Uh, this is this is the one. It's a little bit a little bit more robust, and they come in different sizes from uh, like one millimeter, one point five, one point eight millimeter diameter uh, inserts there. Um, and uh, one other thing, oh, we better just leave it for now. Uh, that you can you can use when you're testing the the flexibility of the reed is to. You can use this as a weight to hold it down. You can measure how far it goes down. And you can see, you can just about see, I should probably go back into the magnifier, but I won't, no time for that. That goes going down about a little over, about two millimeters. Whereas the Thunderbird goes down twice as much goes down like four millimeters. So that's, a, that's in my mind, a little bit too, a little bit too flexible. But like I say, I mean, they did a great job. They, they were pushed to a limit with the, 
the materials and the limitations of production, and they did a great job at it. But it's it's really, uh, I think you get a better job if you if you do the soldering yourself and use a, a little more higher, you know, higher pitch reed to start with, and that also allows you to put a bit of a radius on the reed. Okay, uh, I think we're about done. Oh. Do I tune to A440 or A442? Um, I do a lot of my, it depends on if I'm using the harmonica with my concertina because I do a lot of playing with the concertina. Uh, and uh, so uh, what I, I generally tune to 441. Uh, the factory supposedly tunes to 442. Uh, but uh, uh, that's once again that deterrent and if I'm if I'm playing solo if it's something else I'm playing with somebody else it might be a little different once again the what type of temperament I use you know how far I want to flatten the uh, the thirds if it's if it's a, a solo harmonica and especially a blues piece that I'm playing I might give it a proper just intonation tuning um, but if it's something I'm playing with a concertina I've cheated the concertina in the keys that I play in from from C to uh, to uh, A is are the you know are the most keys C G D A and E a little bit. I will drop those thirds, and with the concertina, I will those thirds like uh, the F sharp and and the B natural, and the C sharp. I'll tune them maybe 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 five cents flat because um, I have to play the concertina in all the different keys. So I'll tune the harmonica to kind of suit the the. Uh, Concertina. Now the other thing is that the uh, the Peterson app has another has another in-app purchase for harmonica tunings, and um, and it's actually when they were coming out with that, uh, I provided them when uh, uh, when Honer went to a a computerized tuning process, I, I provided them with charts for all the different tuning, the country tuning, the the harmonic minor, the melodic minor, and I gave those charts to Peterson, and so you can actually you could actually tune your harmonica according to these charts as well. Um, but for myself, I kind of know how much flat or sharp I want to tune the reeds for how I want it tempered, so I just leave it at, at the 441. Or if I'm tuning for somebody else, like some of the chromatic players, you know, they might want 443. Uh, some of them tuned. I know Blackie Shackner. I think he tuned his for harmonicas, his chromatics to like 446, 447, because he played, you know, he played hard to bring it down. But anyway, out of time. Thank you so much, folks. Um, and I hope you enjoyed yourself and hope we meet again. And uh, take care. Health and joy to all. Cheers now.